Hey, David. Hi, how are you? Doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you. Are you out in LA or is it not that early? No, like, I'm in New York. Oh, nice. Right on. Very cool. Um, <laughs> okay, so my first question is just what drew you to the good half? Well, the good half, uh, what drew me to the good half? There was an incredible script written by amazing writer Brett and um I really loved it. And Robert Schwartzman is an incredible artist himself, director, musician, and just all around hilarious person. So once I read the script and read the character, it just he's such a narcissistic character. His name's Rick. He's the stepfather to uh Nick Jonas character, Ren. And uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about Rick. He's a real narcissist. He can kind of uh thinks about himself, even though this whole sort of experience is about Nick Jonas and, and uh, Brittany Snow's characters losing their mother, but he makes it about him. I, I, I do have a question about Rick. So he's kind of the, the comedic relief punching bag presented as somebody who is not grieving properly or respectfully. So I wanted to know, in your opinion, do you think Rick was genuinely grieving? And is there a distinctly wrong way to, to grieve the loss of somebody? There's definitely a wrong way. You have to really walk a really fine line when grieving and dealing with people who are going through that experience. You have to be really sensitive to it. It really brings up a lot in each other. They're like, uh, brings out a lot of your, your insecurities and just stress and all the different factors. You know, everything's ramped up usually in that time period. So you have to have a level of grace and understanding. Oh, you, you're frozen, David. I can't hear you anymore. <laughs> for him easy for him you know he makes all the decisions there's this big argument they get in at the end of the film uh rick's character and nick's character and um uh sorry my character rick and nick jonah's character ren they get in this big argument but it's funny my uh my inspiration for why i got up so upset in that in that scene wasn't because of what he was saying to me. Uh, it's funny because in the script, it was written that we all go from the funeral to the memorial service in a limousine together. It was written in the scene. We we're all supposed to go. But then Robert called up and he said, listen, David, I was thinking uh, we're not going to have Rick in, in that scene. So you, you don't have to come in for another hour and a half or two hours. It's like, fine, that's cool. For me personally, that was cool. But for Rick, he was really upset. He was like, what do you mean? <laughs> like for in my head, like Rick was like, what do you mean I'm not in the limousine? Like I paid for that limousine. I you know, I was really excited to ride in that limousine. Like that's where his brain <laughs> goes. Yeah. So when he gets upset in that scene, he's really upset about not being able to be to have driven in the limousine. <laughs> so just to me, that's funny. So as sort of actor, uh, you know, interpretation. So how do you, with a character like Rick, he is kind of, you know, over the top. He is much more interested in his appearance than the, the the grieving of these children. So what kind of, how do you connect yourself to that kind of person? Because it, the, just from chatting with you now, that does not seem like the person that you are. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I was once, I was just, I'm fascinated by narcissists in general. There's just such like a lack of empathy and like, it's really all about them. And I once asked my therapist, they said, I'm fascinated by uh, narcissists. Like, do you have any narcissistic clients? Can you tell me something about them? He's like, no, I don't have any narcissistic clients. I was like, really? That's surprising. He goes, do you want to know why? And I said, why? He goes, they don't need me. <laughs> that said it all to me. So, you know, it was funny because things would happen in improvisation and, and sort of on the set. And you know, I would go into my Rick brain about it. Like, you know, he'd just get really annoyed by things. And, you know, he's, you know, always sort of on a schedule. And, you know, everything was about him. 
like the way he looked at every situation like you know he was a just kind of bugged by people like if it didn't fit right into his you know world he would you know often like he was supposed to go to meet these kids to talk to the the priest that would be you know speaking in front of the, the group at the funeral and he stops and gets a smoothie like he's just that kind of guy <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask about your love of clowns because they have this rap of being scary to a lot of people, but they're this inherent, like funny uh, imagery. So do you think that duality of like comedy and horror that exists in clowns is somehow related to how grief and humor um, coexist together? And it's especially displayed in, in the movie, The Good Pla uh, the good Half. Wow, that's interesting. Um yeah, clowns are a really important aspect to society. They're one of the, back in the sort of monarchy, they were the only ones that could really speak truth to power without the fear of being beheaded. <laughs> so they had this really interesting role in the in the court. And, um, and I think they do sort of shine a mirror on society. So I, I believe personally that kind of our society is in such a dark place right now that we really need happy clowns more than ever. And it's really important for them to be out there and sort of making people laugh. So scary clowns are sort of imposters. They're not uh, real clowns. They're clowns. A true clown is supposed to bring joy and happiness and laughter. And they make themselves the joke. So you can laugh. They allow you to laugh at them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, scary clown phenomenon is more based on a lot of I don't know, scary stuff I don't really understand as much or care to. Yeah. Um, do you see it, Rick, as the clown of the movie? Now that you describe it that way. <laughs> <it's> like... <laughs> Rick is a clown in a way that, you know, there's Commedia dell'arte is a root of a lot of clowning. And there's all these, you know, different characters within that. So Rick is sort of an element of that. There's one character who's the the boss that knows nothing. You know what I mean? So, so it's really like bossing people around. Really, he's the one who's kind of the moron. So there's an <laughs> element of that for sure in this character. Oh, I, I talked with Robert uh, last week, and he was talking about how he wanted to run the set as like this collaborative, vulnerable space. Um, so can you talk a little bit about your experience as an actor on it and then how it maybe felt different from other horror movies or other types of genre movies that you've been a part of? Yeah, Robert has such a fantastic sort of energy to him and he's really cool and like just understands music and comedy and and literature. So the way he sort of set it up, so we, we kind of have these you know, rehearsals that were kind of open to improvisation and little things. And, you know, uh, uh, Nick Jonas' character and Brittany Stowe's character have this really interesting relationship too, where they're kind of have this wry sense of humor where they're kind of throwing it back and forth to each other, kind of under their breath almost. And it's really kind of cutting sometimes and, you know, edgy you know Nick's character doesn't want to be in Cleveland at this time and we apologize to Cleveland Cleveland's an incredible city it gets sort of a bad rap in this film because it was taken from the writer's personal experiences and he was going back to see Rick and was not excited about it having to deal with this sort of tragedy so it does get a bad rap but I love Cleveland everyone should go to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame it's an amazing place that being said, so we'd have these rehearsals where we'd kind of just joke around and, and you know, Nick's, you know, Nick would say, like, well, is that a smoothie? And I was like, yeah, it's a smoothie juice. I just said, for some reason, I said smoothie juice, <laughs> I think. And then uh, Robert was like, smoothie juice. That's so funny. But can you say that again? And then after he says that, say smooth. <laughs> I can make up this stupid word <laughs> and uh, you know and there's a way of like doing it and you have to like kind of do it and sell it and not overdo it you know there's this funny line you have to kind of find mm -hmm. I found like Rick was interesting because the, the script itself was really 
rich so you didn't have to push it too much so it's kind of like just doing it i mean you know you have all this sort of backstory going on you know, in one scene, he's got a drink. He did literally like shown up before everybody, but stayed at the bar until after everyone was seated. Like that kind of little detail that they add just adds to like, oh, that's where this guy's coming from. As someone living in Pittsburgh, I can't condone all of the positive Cleveland uh, references that you've made, but <laughs> it's a, it's a oh, rivalry oh, between us. So there is. I, do I love appreciate it too. I appreciate all the dunking on Cleveland. <laughs> yeah, okay, good, good. <laughs> um, so there's a recurring theme of characters collecting small, unassuming objects that connect them to one another. And I was wondering if there's some specific object in your life that you, if it, someone saw it on the shelf, they wouldn't think twice about it, but it holds something deep and meaningful to you. Absolutely. I'm sort of a collector. So there's a ton of things that I just have that... Uh, that remind me of friends and like, you know, uh, people I've lost in my life. But my favorite is probably from a film I did uh, called Dream with the Fishes. And Kathy Moriarty played my aunt in it, or my friend's aunt in it. And she had these pasties <laughs> and they're put up on this thing. <laughs> this is kind of ridiculous that I have these pasties, but they had given it to me at the end of the film. So I was like, oh. That just was a meaningful film. I did it right after I did the first Scream. And uh, I don't know, it always makes, it's just sitting on the wall. So it always reminds me of that time period. That's awesome. Um, my last question for you is about the upcoming theatrical run. So it's going to have two nights in theaters with the Q&A with Robert and Nick. Um, so what does the communal theatrical experience mean to you as an actor, as someone who's been in film for as long as you have? Uh, it's really great. I mean, when you watch a film with people and you're having the shared experience, it kind of just elevates it. Mm -hmm. It's not as personal. It's not like you're sitting there on your phone. It's just like an individual moment. You're there with people. And especially in a film like this that has, you know, laughter and has, you know, emotion. Really is the kind of film that you might get choked up in and, and, you know, I personally feel like that, you you know, I, I feel a lot with, you know, just people around me and just especially laughter, you know, a room full of laughter. It's just such a uplifting feeling. So it's really important that people get out there and see this film and uh, just embrace the sort of communal aspect of film watching. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, David. It's it's a really lovely, lovely film. And I laughed and cried, but by myself in my apartment. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I hope you can get to see it with the group. Yeah. Yes. And horror movies, especially with the group. Screaming, it's, you know, screaming at the screen. That's yeah. my favorite. <laughs>